The Coalition <coughs> believes that Australia must have a clear and predictable foreign policy, focused and effective, practical and principled. Our foreign policy must advance our security and our prosperity and be underpinned by strong bilateral and multilateral relationships that will benefit the lives of Australians. It must extend our reach and influence in the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific, while recognising that our interests are indeed global. As a long-standing democratic country, we need a foreign policy with a conscience that is based on our values of democratic freedom, rule of law, and universal human rights. We must promote human rights consistently, vigorously, while recognising that other countries will and do develop differently. Our ability to promote our values, to advance greater political and economic freedom and to assist in poverty reduction and economic self-reliance <coughs> in developing countries is essential to our long-term survival and our security and our prosperity. Economic diplomacy is also a vital part of foreign policy and while it doesn't rest on trade alone, for our nation's interests are far wider than that, it is our success as a trading nation with an open export-oriented economy that has made us the country we are today. These are the principles that will guide me should I be honoured to become the Foreign Minister of Australia. And these are the principles that will guide me in repairing what I believe to be one of our most important foreign policy priorities, and that is our relationship with China. This year, Australia and China celebrate the 40th anniversary of the reopening of diplomatic relations between our two countries. The statistic that perhaps best highlights how our relationship has developed is that over that span of four decades, the value of our trade with China has increased from about $113 million to well in excess of $100 billion today. At least half of the world's economic growth over the past 10 years coming out of China. Should its current rate of growth continue, it will overtake the United States as the world's largest economy in the not too distant future. For the Chinese people, these reforms <coughs> in China have brought immense benefits. China's economic miracle has lifted hundreds of millions of its citizens out of poverty. The decline in its poverty rate stands as one of the greatest humanitarian achievements of our era. The rapid expansion of China's economic base has resulted in a large increase in the size of its middle class, estimated to be around 137 million people, but just 12% of its population in 2010. It's a land of incredible social, economic, cultural and demographic complexity and diversity. For us, to broaden and deepen and diversify our relationship, we need to take a keen interest in what is being described as the China story. Will the next chapter in its history be a continuation of the past few decades of phenomenal growth? Will future political reforms match the economic reforms of decades past? <coughs> there is, of course, no one China story. <coughs> During a number of visits to China over the past 12 months, I have been struck time and again by the enormous development challenges confronting the Chinese leadership to ensure the nation's economic transformation flows through the population from the southeast to the northwest. The Chinese government is acutely aware of the growing income disparity and the potential for social unrest, and the road ahead for China will have its challenges, and undoubtedly her policymakers will have some great successes and some failures, as does every nation. The pace of economic and political reform will be guided by the dual imperatives of continuing the pace of economic growth of the past three decades while ensuring the benefits of that growth are more evenly shared to guard against the potential for social unrest. And this balance will not be easily achieved. For example, the United Nations Population Fund has reported that China's one-child policy over the past three decades has brought serious distortions to demographic distribution and has concluded that should the projections prove correct, China will become old before it gets rich. A World Bank report released 
in recent weeks and in time in China 2030, building a modern, harmonious and creative high-income society, finds that China has reached a critical point in its development and that the model for growth over the past three decades would have to be changed so that China avoids a hard economic landing, which would, of course, not only have implications for the rest of the world, but have implications internally for the holy grail of social stability. While there are more economic reforms underway within China, the warning of the World Bank that its current growth model is unsustainable should serve to place greater urgency into reform efforts if China's leadership decides to continue down that path. What we're currently seeing in China is the inevitable tension that has been building from the decision 30 years ago to induce greater competition and freedom to the Chinese economy while maintaining the strong influence of the Communist Party. Now, I don't encourage China to undertake political reforms because I wish to impose our values on another nation. I believe, respectfully, that it is in China's long-term interest to become a more open and free society that encourages debate and can embrace dissent. I believe, respectfully, that it is in China's long-term interest to play a key role as a key international stakeholder, promoting greater freedom around the globe. While China's economic re-emergence is reshaping the way the international system operates, as we've known it, for Australia, the way in which we adapt to this situation will have a significant bearing on our future prosperity and security. Australia has been amongst the greatest beneficiaries of China's economic re-emergence. For all our successes, however, Australia's relationship with China has stalled in recent years. Much of the work of broadening and deepening and diversifying our relationship has fallen on the shoulders of Australian businesses and state governments eager to expand their trade and investment ties. The Australian Government, first under Kevin Rudd and now under Prime Minister Gillard, has failed to provide the strategic leadership that is needed if the bilateral relationship is to grow over the long term. When this Government came to office in 2007, neither the Prime Minister nor the Deputy Prime Minister, nor indeed most of its front bench, had any previous ministerial experience. In the field of foreign policy, a few diplomatic blunders from a new and inexperienced government are inevitable. But Kevin Rudd had promoted himself as a China expert, and much was expected of him. Yet, stung by media suggestions that he was a self-styled Manchurian candidate, Mr <laughs> Rudd appeared to set out to distance himself and Australia from China at every opportunity with a series of clumsy diplomatic blunders. On his first visit to China as Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd's overconfidence led him to publicly lecture the Chinese on human rights, making a direct appeal to the Chinese people before he had met with the country's leadership. To the best of my knowledge, Australia is the only country with which China has agreed to a human rights dialogue at the ministerial level. Yet Mr Rudd ignored the Australia-China Human Rights Dialogue, the very mechanism which had been created by the Howard government to provide an official forum for raising such concerns. Other small but telling incidents followed. Mr Rudd's refusal to be seated on a television show panel next to China's ambassador to the United Kingdom and using abusive, if not colourful, language to describe Chinese officials at a climate change conference and the like. But a more serious issue was the Rudd government's defence white paper, which tacitly identified China as posing a conventional military threat to Australia's sovereignty. It was not smart, politically, <laughs> diplomatically, strategically, militarily, to make such a call. <coughs> and if it were truly the government's view that China was our greatest threat, why did it broadcast its deepest fears for national defence to the entire world. The reaction in Beijing was as one would expect. As Linda Jacobson, the director of the East Asia Program at the Lowy Institute for International Policy and a respected China expert stated, the Rudd factor has been an underlying tension in China-Australia ties for four years. 
After the demise of Kevin Rudd, it was expected that Julia Gillard would take steps to restore the mutual respect and sensitive diplomacy that were the hallmarks of the Howard government's relationship with China. At best, she has attempted to ride on the achievements of the Whitlam government, perhaps in the hope that China would overlook her increasingly apparent indifference. Far too often, the government has been accused of failing to conduct communications with due regard for confidentiality and resorting to megaphone diplomacy. The extent of the government's complacency regarding our bilateral relationship is captured by the fact that there has been only one Prime Ministerial visit to China since the Beijing Olympics. The failure of the Australian government to send a representative to China to attend the Boao Forum for Asia, China's premier platform for discussing the pressing economic issues confronting the region, was seen as a deliberate snub on the part of the Chinese government. This decision led former Prime Minister Bob Hawke to declare that successive Labor governments and I can assure you he didn't mean his, <laughs> had let Australia's crucial relationship with China languish. The coalition will invest the leadership, the commitment, and the energy needed to put Australia's relations with China back on track. <clears throat> we will adopt the fundamental principles of shared interests and mutual respect that existed under the former Howard government. As Prime Minister, John Howard brought Australia closer to China than any other leader, before or after, without jeopardising our close and enduring alliance with the United States. In doing so, he achieved a balance between Australia's strategic and economic interests that was the envy of many countries. We need a comprehensive framework within which to balance, balance our strategic interests. And central to the Coalition's approach will be building on Australia's trade and investment ties with China. In 2011, Australia exported around $72 billion in merchandise goods to China, consisting predominantly of iron ore and concentrates. The export of services to China was worth a further $6 billion, <coughs> consisting mainly of education services. But maximising the opportunities for Australia and Australian businesses, <coughs> given the rapidly expanding Chinese consumer class, remember it's currently only 12% of its population, means putting in place policies that increase our national competitiveness and open up new markets for trade in goods and services and investment. Central to this is finalising a free trade agreement with China at the earliest opportunity. As of this moment, there have been 18 rounds of negotiations. New Zealand, which commenced negotiations with China at the same time that we did, way back in 2005, completed a free trade agreement with China in 2008. A free trade agreement with China will assist Australia's manufacturing and services sectors to gain greater access to the world's <coughs> largest domestic market. Clear opportunities exist in areas such as health and education, finance and tourism, as well as for high-end quality manufacturing <coughs> that can feed into the growing network of supply chains in the region. We must also put in place policies that increase our attractiveness as a destination for foreign direct investment. Australia has been a huge beneficiary of direct investment from China. America's <laughs> Professor Peter Drysdale said that Australia is the largest single ultimate destination for Chinese direct investment, bigger than the United States and as big as all of Europe or any other single country in the world. Given our limited capital reserves, Australia needs foreign investment to underpin project development that will drive economic growth. ANZ has reported that Australia will need around $1.8 trillion of investment over the course of the next 20 years to support the expansion of the resources sector. And this will create, over that period, around 1.5 million jobs. The Coalition has established a working group, I'm the deputy chair of that group, to consider the impact <coughs> of foreign direct investment and a coalition discussion paper will be released publicly in the very near future. The coalition will also give greater support to strengthening Australia's soft power in China, including growing the audience share for the Australia network. And I have many ideas on how that can be achieved. The coalition will also look at ways in which we can support greater levels of two-way student exchange. Our initiatives will build on the spirit of the Colombo Plan devised by the Menzies government. We reached out to the world, drawing in the best and brightest in our region to universities in Australia. 
Menzies believed that education was one of Australia's great competitive advantages and an asset for peace and development in the region. The Colombo Plan created a legacy of enduring friendships and understanding between people and countries in our region. I'm often struck by the number of Colombo Plan alumni that are in positions of influence and power in countries in our region. I believe the time has come for the Australian Government to assist young Australians to undertake educational exchange opportunities at the region's top universities and today that includes a number of universities in China including Peking University. Increasing the number of two-way student exchanges between Australia and China will not only help promote <coughs> greater understanding and awareness but also open up a new generation of networks, people-to-people -people links that Australia can draw upon in the future if we are to capitalise on the opportunities arising from China's re-emergence. The ability to speak a second language, particularly an <coughs> Asian language, will be increasingly important. As Tony Abbott put it in a policy announcement recently, if Australians are going to make their way in the world, we can't rely on other people speaking our language. I was the Minister for Education in 2006 and 2007, and I recognised the strategic importance of building up our foreign language capacity, particularly foreign language teachers, if Australia's national interests were to be advanced. In 2009, the last statistics I could find, only 300 non-Chinese heritage students studied Mandarin <coughs> at a year 12 level in Australia. The Coalition is committed to work urgently with our state governments to ensure that at least 40% of year 12 students are once again taking a language other than English within a decade. Ladies and gentlemen, if elected, the Coalition will set about rebuilding Australia's ties with China. We will inject the leadership and the vision that will allow Australia to fully capitalise on the opportunities that China's re-emergence as an economic superpower will create. The way in which this relationship is managed will have a significant <coughs> bearing on our country's future prosperity and our future security. Many thanks. Um, we're starting again at twenty past six now. Oh, we've got time. Okay, right, over to the floor. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Bishop, for your um, really engaging um, speech. I just wanted to ask very quickly. My interest is in um, the Australia-U.S. alliance and how Australia goes about balancing um, the military alliance that it has with the United States and the very strong trade alliance it has with China. Um, Specifically, I'm referring to U.S. Marines in Darwin, and I'm wondering what your opinion is. Um, if the coalition were to get into power, um, how it would handle that, rela uh, that relationship? Because I know that there was an uh, issue brought up with the current foreign minister Bob Carr and his latest visit to China. So, if you could shed some light on that, I would really appreciate it. And it's most certainly an issue that has been raised with me on my visits to China in um, recent weeks and months. I believe we should take the United States at its word and it says it is not engaging in a containment policy. Without doubt, the United States has um, refocused its energies into the Asia Pacific. And given that this is where so much of the world's economic growth will take place over the coming decades, that is not in the least bit surprising. You would expect the United States to be focusing its efforts as other regions of the world are focusing their efforts on the emerging giants of China, but also India and other countries, including Indonesia, whose economic growth predictions are impressive. The United States says it is not seeking to contain China, but it is seeking to engage in the region. And from my discussions with the leadership in other countries in our region, the ASEAN countries in particular, they are seeking more engagement and more leadership from the United States in the region and not less. Yeah. Australia has a very deep and long-standing strategic alliance with the United States and that comes as a surprise to no one. We already conduct joint military exercises, we have joint facilities on Australian shores and I think the 
um, rotation of a couple of thousand US Marines through Darwin is a natural extension of the relationship that already exists and the uh, military connection that already exists. What I think is important is for Australia to communicate clearly, coherently, its intentions, not only with China, but also with our neighbours closer to home. And I have committed to adopting a no surprises foreign policy, particularly with our closest neighbours. What they resent most of all is being taken by surprise on decisions that impact upon them directly. <coughs> I suggest that more consultation could have taken place in relation to President Obama's announcement in Canberra. Uh, and this government has a very poor track record when it comes to consulting <coughs> in advance of announcements that impact on particular, particular countries in our region. I believe that through constant communication and consultation and a no surprises policy, we can continue to engage with both China and maintain <coughs> our relationship with the United States, combining our strategic and our economic interests, as the Howard government had done. Uh, it has been proven to work in the past, and I'm sure we can achieve that again. May I uh, ask a question? Uh, again, not you have just President's prerogative. <laughs> I'm trying to be modest. Um, at the conference, uh, the Asia Pacific Round Table in Malaysia at the end of May, and a uh, Chinese academic, Peng uh, Zhongming, from Renmin University in Beijing, was talking about uh, the future of China's foreign policy and suggested that China should become a co-manager with the United States of the region and globally. And then went on to say we should be co hegemons uh, with the United States regionally and globally. And he based that in private conversation okay. later on the historic uh, position that China had several hundred years ago, uh, dating back many centuries prior to that, and also on the fact that China was going to be or overtake the United States economically, uh, and given its population uh, and its economic power, uh, it would assume uh, regional and global <coughs> political and strategic power. Uh, the interesting thing was when that, those words were put up to an audience, which was fundamentally uh, uh, regional, um, 10 or 15 years ago, there probably would have been a rush to the homes and uh, you know, a major panic. Everybody just accepted that as probably a fait accompli within the next uh, 20, 25 years. Does that accord with your view? Well, there probably wasn't a rush to the phones or a rush to the cables or texts. <coughs> However, our diplomats um, um, respond to these sorts of issues these days because this is a topic that is the subject of so much discussion. The United States China relationship and how countries in our region and globally uh, will be affected by the development of that relationship as China re-emerges as a global economic power. I wouldn't use the phrase co-management. Um, I certainly would have noted that had it been said in my presence. But I think that we all want to see a prosperous and stable China we all want to see, because it's in all of our interests, um, China's economy remains strong. We all want to see social stability in China. We respectfully disagree with the way they may go about maintaining social stability. And we want to see China take a greater role in international affairs. For example, in the Middle East, in Syria, I believe China has an important role to play, not just its vote, on the Security Council, but it has an important role to play in trying to find a solution to the um, drastic situation that is engulfing Syria. So I think one of the likely outcomes will be greater interaction between the United States and China and even joint military exercises and um, a joint approach to issues in our region. And I believe that there is a lot of opportunity for that. That doesn't mean co-managing. I'm not sure that countries in the region like to see themselves as being managed. 
but I certainly see a greater role for China in global affairs. And if it is to have such a dominant position, economic position, with so many countries and regions now relying on China as their major or one of their major trading partners, then clearly uh, it will have influence and we have to ensure that it uses its influence for good and for the betterment of the globe. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bishop, since 2006, the Australian government has prevented its uh, senior officials from making direct contact with the <coughs> government of uh, Baini Marama in Fiji. Mm. This has given open slather to many others, particularly the Chinese government, to donate and influence politically uh, in relation to its affairs. Now, uh, what has been missing from its suspension from the uh, Pacific Island Forum, Commonwealth Secretariat, and the European <coughs> Union has more than been made up by the uh, Chinese influence in adding it to its uh, string of pearls of maritime influence. Would the any future coalition government alter its attitude towards dealing directly with Brian Marama's government? Yes, we have already. Uh, announced and I have spoken on a number of occasions about the approach that we believe Australia should adopt in relation to Fiji. Uh, we do not <coughs> condone military coups and in 2006 the military coup that brought Bainey Mar Marama to power uh, was condemned not only by Australia but by other Commonwealth countries and uh, nations around the world. And the sanctions that were put in place at that time were a measure of that condemnation. But here we are, six years later, and you have to ask what has been achieved by that. Fiji is a major economy in the Pacific. It's a major influence in the Pacific. And if we vacate the field, the vacuum will quickly be filled by others. I've called on the government to recommence its relationship with the government in Fiji. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with what they've done. We can continue to condemn military coups. And the coalition has committed to working on a roadmap that would normalise relations with Fiji based on the assumption that Baini Marama will commit to an election in 2014. Now, back in 2006, when he said he'd hold an election in 2014, that was a world away. But it's very close in time now. The other point I think we're worth making is that while we have these sanctions in place with Fiji, the Australian <coughs> people are flocking to Fiji as tourists in record numbers. It undermines the integrity of the government's position. I also think, think it's worth noting that our friends, including New Zealand, the United States and Japan, have all called upon Australia to reset its uh, policy settings in relation to Fiji. So we would most certainly do that. I want to see Fiji back in the Commonwealth, back as part of the negotiations for the PESA plus free trade agreement in the region and back playing a leading role in the Pacific as it has the um, destiny to do. However, we obviously must commit to democratic elections and the reinstatement of the rule of law and the democratic institutions upon which a member of the Commonwealth must found its, um, its nation. So there's a lot of work to be done and we shouldn't waste time in the current standoff. And I want to see Fiji and Australia normalise their relations as soon as possible based on all of the principles that I have um, articulated previously about what underpins our foreign policy in Heritage. Uh, Mr. Bishop, you, you made clear that you thought it was a bad idea for the 2009 Defence White Paper mm. to say publicly what it did uh, in relation to China. Uh, but what is your view on the extent to which Australian military power is an influence on China, can be in the future, and more broadly, can you give some thoughts on how 
military power, diplomatic power and economic weight work together to give Australia influence in the world? My concern with the White Paper of 2009 was not just that it set out China as the most likely conventional military threat that Australia faces. It then set out a list of hardware that Australia would need to counter this threat. <coughs> In the latest budget, the government has deleted that list of hardware, effectively. So we're left with a statement to the world that we think we're facing a military threat from China, but we've just scrapped all of the mechanisms by which we can defend ourselves. It's just an incoherent position. And as I said, I don't think it was politically, strategically, militarily, <coughs> diplomatically very smart at all. Um, clearly, Australia as an island continent needs a strong defence. Clearly, a foundation of our uh, national defence is our alliance with the United States. But we need to ensure that all of the policy levers, whether it be our military strength, our economic strength, our diplomatic efforts, our aid efforts, that they're all working together uh, to achieve our national interest. And one of my criticisms of the current government, and yes, I admit I have a number, one of my criticisms <laughs> is that its foreign policy, which includes all of those um, hard power and soft power levers, seems to have lost direction. There's no coherency to it. We need an overarching framework that encompasses all of those elements to position ourselves <coughs> so that we can defend our nation and be a strong, stable, <coughs> prosperous country in the region. And I have said often that Australia's standing in the world is at its highest when our influence in our region is at its strongest. And that's what we should be seeking <coughs> to do with our foreign defence and aid development policies. Thank you, Ms. Bishop, for your enlightening and illuminating talk regarding <coughs> Australia and China and the foreign policy. I have two questions. One is pertinent to the subject. Um, what if China falls? I know it's very strong at the moment. Why is Australia relying so heavily and it's increased its trade 144 fold in the last X years? Um, what will happen if China falls and Australia is so dependent on it? Why are we so, why are we not diversifying into other nations? And how could we do that so we sustain ourselves? Had I been speaking on Australia's trading relationships with the world, uh, I would have said, as I will now, that we should view the world as our marketplace. The globe is Australia's marketplace. We are a trading nation. And yes, I am concerned that we have focused so much of our effort on China with an assumption, might I say an arrogant assumption, that China will continue to buy our commodities at record prices. There are um, increasing signs of competitiveness from a number of other countries. So <coughs> set to one side any um, hard or soft economic landing that China might or may not experience. Just the whole idea of putting all your eggs in one basket is not a great, well, that's not a great idea. And that we should be diversifying our engagement on a trading basis with countries that serve our national interests. That includes India, it includes Indonesia, it includes the European Union. It includes Latin America. There are many countries where Australia's strength and uh, the, what we have to offer would be um, welcomed in other parts of the world. And that kind of um, bilateral or um, regional engagement is so necessary. So I think for a whole variety of reasons, not actually even about China's economic position, but I think for a whole variety of reasons, <coughs> Australia needs to engage more deeply with other countries and particularly on free trade agreements. Sure, the multilateral Doha round would bring the highest and best benefits to the greatest number of people, but that is stalled and we just can't stand by and hope that uh, the multilateral trade um, agreement will restart. 
we have to keep moving forward to engage on a bilateral basis with so many countries. And we have a number of free trade agreements commenced under the Ford government, the former government that are yet to be concluded or anywhere near concluded, including with South Korea, including with India, Indonesia, Japan, um, the Gulf Cooperation Council you know, countries. A, a free trade agreement I've mooted with the European Union. Um, so there's much that we can do. And um, I agree that it's, it's always dangerous. <laughs> Any business person can tell you that. It's always dangerous to have <coughs> only one customer. Good evening. Just one question. I want to embarrass you on one very sensitive issue. <laughs> uh, we all deal with this sensitive issue. This is the Tibetan issue. Yeah. Uh, how do you consider the Tibetan issue? Is it a purely internal issue for China? China, or is it an issue you would like to discuss with the Chinese authorities? And would you advise the next Liberal Prime Minister to receive in Canberra the Dalai Lama? We all believe in the One China policy, and we're all committed to it, and we've all committed to respecting China's sovereignty. And yet we recognise that China has issues not only with Tibet, but also with Taiwan in relation to its sovereignty. Having excoriated Kevin Rudd for lecturing China on human rights. <coughs> you will forgive me if I'm not about to do it this evening. But that is why, for that precise reason, that is why we set up a ministerial level human rights dialogue with China so that our foreign ministers and relevant ministers could discuss these issues, not just official to official, but actually minister to minister. And mind you, China does take the opportunity to have its say about Australia's record on human rights in that dialogue. So it's not a one-way street. Uh, in relation to Tibet, Prime Minister Howard did meet with the Dalai Lama. Um, I have certainly met with the Dalai Lama as in, in opposition. And the way I read it is if you talk to China about your intentions, if you reassure them um, where they need reassurance, and agree to disagree where that is your position, then the relationship continues. Now, in the case of um, Tibet, the Chinese government has actually offered for Australian politicians <coughs> to visit Tibet. Sure, they'll accompany us there, but they've, they've offered for Australians to, to Australian parliamentarians to visit Tibet, and that's the kind of that is the kind of um, offer that we should take up and continue to discuss the concerns that we have on human rights through the dialogue. Well, I think it would be better to maintain the goodwill that currently exists by respecting that framework, that mechanism that Australia, as I understand, uniquely has in place and use it to um, the advantage of those who are calling on us for support.